Um, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about my perspective on, uh, on colorectal cancer screening. Um, I, I should perhaps explain that I'm d uh, the director of the Bar Cancer Screening Hub for the south of England, and that means I'm serving a population of 14.6 million. So I have a responsibility for screening at the moment 55-year-olds and all uh, on a two-yearly basis who are between the ages of 60 and 75. And, and I'm talking about a program that started in 2006. So I've got a sort of practical experience of how, how programs are running. So, well, just background. Uh, colorectal cancer, second most commonest cause of cancer deaths in Europe. So it's really high up there in terms of priorities and probably in men who don't smoke. Men have a higher incidence and smoking is a, a major reason for cancer death. It's probably the most common cause of cancer death. So it really is a critical condition. Um, and we know that screening uh, can detect cancers early. It, it, bowel cancer can be detected very early with, with screening. Um, and so we can, uh, we can get to it before these cancers become symptomatic. Um, and so we can develop and, and we can remove them by uh, identifying the advanced adenomas, which is the precursor stage, the early stage prior to them developing into cancer. And this is not new. 20 years ago, there were some very large randomized control trials that demonstrated that using a relatively crude test, in fact, it's a test that's still currently being used in the UK, that you could reduce mortality. All these studies across the world showed exactly that, that evidence. And that has been the stimulus for countries developing screening programs, because there was this really good evidence. More than that, when people have looked at the costing of, um, of screening programs, they cost less than does the treatment. And in fact, treatment for colorectal cancer continues to climb. We're, we're getting better and better at, at treating colorectal cancer uh, in terms of uh, reducing it to a degree, or certainly keeping people alive for a longer period of time, but at a cost. Um, and uh, the cost of screening, organized screening, is relatively small in comparison. So that's an important message for governments. Um, and the test, the, the faecal occult blood test that, uh, that you heard a little bit about already, is a simple test. It's easy to do, and it's, it's cheap. And it, it was with that knowledge and with evidence that had come from a number of countries who'd actually implemented uh, screening programs, and Italy was a good example, they've been running it for some significant time, that the European Union eventually decided it was appropriate that they should put some guidance together to help countries through the process of setting up screening programs. So they were published around about 2009, um, and uh, the essence of those guidelines is that that we should be screening not just the, the healthy and wealthy, we should be trying to get to the total population. So we're talking about population-based screening programs. Um, and uh, evidence is that if you have the right test and if you have the right system, right structure in place, then you get pretty good adherence to, to, the, uh, to the program and good participation. And uh, the general means of, of screening with this system is that you're screened every couple of years. Could be once a year, but usually one, once every two years is, is adequate. Um, and uh, I should say, at, at the point in time that those um, guidance um, material was produced, uh, the FIT test, the fecal immunochemical test, which was the newer test uh, available to us, had, uh, had got good evidence to prove that it would work, and that it was advocated as being the preferred screening test in those guidelines. So I just thought you might like to see a little bit of the data from England. Um, we're, uh, Great Britain split into different countries. So this is, this is England, and these, the red markers here indicate the level of, of uptake. It's repeat uptake, actually. And I have a responsibility for, for this area around here, just around London uh, and uh, from Kent through to Cornwall. Um, and the essence of the program is we want to get to everybody. And that is a challenge. We want, to get to, uh, we want to be able to get to prisoners. We want to be able to get to individuals who've got um, uh, 
disabilities of one sort or another that make life difficult for them. We want to be able to get to the homeless, which is another real challenge, as well as get it to everybody else. So we go to some trouble to ensure that there is literature available in a range of languages, that we have material that's in Braille, that we can provide sign language facilities if necessary and translation facilities. And we're conscious that in that age group uh, there will still be people who've got poor, poor learning abilities and they need pictorial uh, information, not just written uh, material. And so what, what do we see? Well, we're getting around about 60% uptake in, in, in the area that I'm providing a screening programme. That isn't true quite the whole of England, it's a little less than that, but in the south of England, 61% will be the average uptake. Um, what happens to the other people who don't do the test first time round? This is, this is this group. And around about 20% of people who were invited again do it, and of course some don't do it that time, and then they, they come in later on, and the, the, the proportion of people that then um, take up the test diminishes over a while. The other good news is that if people do the test, even though this is a faecal test, so it's a matter of getting a small amount of faecal material onto a stick and then into a, into a device, um, the uptake's around about 90%. So it doesn't put people off. And what does it show when you look at the outcome? So you do the test, the test is a, an assessment of risk, um, and if this suggests that you, you've got a significant risk of colorectal cancer, you move to colonoscopy, which is the definitive uh, gold-plated test. Uh, so colonoscopy is performed, um, and we remove polyps and cancers for around about 50%. 50% of the people who are referred to colonoscopy uh, get referred to. You've got here um, data, which is the... Is it a point of work? No, just about. Yeah, so this is people invited for the first time, the second time, and the third time. It's quite interesting, that is, because if you look at the amount of cancer and precursor lesions, the advanced adenomas, you're seeing that diminish with time. And that's because we're removing it from the population. Each time we screen, we identify cancers and, and, and precancers uh, and remove them. So that's an indication of, of the effectiveness of the program. And so some headlines from the UK. Um, total population 55 million. That, that is eligible for screening 7.7. .7. A lot of tests have been performed, 24 million test kits have been sent out, um, about a quarter of a million positive test results, uh, somewhat over a quarter of a million colonoscopies have performed. And in terms of clinical outcomes, um, around about 20,000 cancers have been identified since this program began, and 55,000 precancers. So this is sort of diagnostic, this is preventative. So the figures are really pretty impressive, and in fact the, the rate now is, is increasing because the program's completely rolled out. So, um, there are issues to do with uh, barriers of uptake, because um, you could well argue, so why isn't this being done over the whole of, of Europe? Well, there was initially some professional preference for colonoscopy. I see that's, that's gradually disappeared because uh, colonoscopy still has a place in screening, but uh, it's not, a, not a, uh, a good primary screening tool. Um, there was concern about the unattractive nature of doing a, a three-stool uh, test. Um, fortunately, what we've seen is a better test that only requires a single sample. It's much more convenient and clean, so the uptake of that is much better. So that's the, that's the test. Organisation. The organisation is the really critical issue here. If you can organise a programme... Uh, in, in a way that's centralised, uh, that's overseen, that's monitored, um, then, then you're in with a chance. And we, we've got a, a, a range of healthcare systems that, that impede, uh, to some extent, the, the role in the screening programmes. There's been a reluctance to centralise screening and to have it in an organised fashion. But the evidence now is increasingly clear that the only way to be able to get good uptake is to do it in an organised fashion. Um, and there's been a sort of sensitivity to the role that primary care, the general practitioner, plays in this process. And primary care is very important, but it can impede the, uh, the provision of, of population-based screening program because it then depends upon the preferences and the views of the primary care physician. So whereas one would want the primary care physician to be supportive of the program, what you don't want them to do is be in a position whereby... Uh, they may be 
um, uh, not playing ball, not helping facilitate the programme. And of course, it will always be a challenge to get good uptake to uh, that proportion of the population that is generally disinterested in their health. And that will remain a, uh, an issue for us. Um, but uh, bit by bit, we will um, make progress. So my view is that what we need is a centralised uh, screening programme using large centres, a, a small number of laboratories so that the quality is consistently good, a streamlined system with primary care playing a supportive rather than a central role, that it should be population-based. That means you, you, the aim is to get to the whole population rather than, a, than an opportunistic approach where... Uh, you have to decide yourself whether or not you want to approach your GP and request a test. That process gives you very poor uptake, plenty of evidence to support that. That you need an information system, a centralised information system, so you can gather all the data, so you can see what's working, so you really know what the uptake is, what the positivity rate is, uh, what the clinical outcomes are, so you can demonstrate to to the population and to government and the healthcare system of the, the efficacy of the process. And all the evidence suggests at the moment that we should be starting with FIT, the faecal immunochemical test, which I'll mention in a minute. It's a, there's good evidence behind it. It's safe, it's practical, uh, it's flexible, uh, and it's affordable. So, immunochemical testing, because I don't expect this audience to be necessarily familiar with it. Um, what is it? What are its benefits? How does it work? Well, it's different to the, the GUIAC test, which is what the randomised control trials I mentioned used. That measures the heme bit of haemoglobin. Haemoglobin, you'll know, is the, the red bit in, in blood. Um, the, it used to measure heme. We can't measure heme so, so well, but what we can measure is the globin bit of haemoglobin. That's a protein, and it's unique to humans. So if you measure globin, you know you're measuring blood from the human species, not some contamination from, from food. Uh, so that's what, that's what the, the, the FIT test does. It's faecal immunochemical test for haemoglobin, using globin as a marker. And as a consequence, uh, it means that interferences that can occur with the old star test just disappear. That the test is, is, good, uh, is too good to, to, to be interfered with for that. And it's using a conventional analytical technique, which means that you've still got to provide a faecal sample, but you can measure, uh, you can ramp up the sensitivity, and you can detect cancer and high-risk adenomas uh, in abundance. It's an automated test, so there are a number of instruments that now can read it. So that means it lends itself to large-scale population-based screening. Um, the UK is currently running a pilot to see how the FIT test will perform in our hands. Uh, and the key issue there is that you present it to the public in a way that makes it easy for them to do. So you don't send them lots of bits of paper and lots of se separate bits of instruction. You combine it. So this is, the, this is the system that we're using, which is a box and has the kit inside it, and the instructions are inside the box. And you just reconfigure the box uh, and then send it back. So you don't need a separate envelope. It's all within the box. I can show you an example of that afterwards if you're interested. Um, and evidence suggests that we're getting an extra 10% increase in uptake by using this technology rather than the old technology. So that's really exciting for, for us. So um, I think this is just the beginning of a process. Uh, FIT is a single test, but it can be combined with other parameters. You'll be aware that when people assess your coronary heart disease risk, they don't just sing, use a single parameter like cholesterol. They measure a lot of other things, including your BMI, your body mass index. And FIT can be used in that way as well. It's a, it gives you a numeric result, uh, and you can therefore personalize it by uh, combining it with other parameters. So that's a, a direction of travel. And this is a bit of speculation. One of the criticisms you can make of population-based screening programs is that they're a bit impersonal. It's a centralized process. Um, but what you potentially can do is make use of the internet to communicate more effectively with individuals without making it a cumbersome process. So people do want to know more about their test and how to do it and what the implications are. They want to know more about the risks and, and such like. Um, and so we can make use of a, a QR code, so the letter that goes out or the box that goes out 
can carry a code which is unique to that individual, which will mean that by making use of their smartphone or iPad or whatever it might be, um, they can find information about them and their progress through a screening process. So they would go into a personalised bowel screening account. Um, it would give information about when they were last screened, when they're next going to be screened, possibly what the outcomes were. Um, and it can provide ready information about uh, how the test performs, what the screening programme is about. And it can be contextualised, so you'll get the information that's relevant to you at your age uh, and wherever you are in the screening process. And of course it can be in whatever language you want it to be. And um, we can learn a little bit from DHL and Amazon. Amazon are pretty good at telling us information about how our package is arriving through the post from Hong Kong or wherever it might be coming from. And uh, we can use that QR code to, to do that as well. Um, so there's, uh, there's DHL. So DHL would uh, uh, follow your package as you go through. And with this program, I can see no reason why we can't do the same. So people will get to know that we have received their package and that a result has been found, and they could, they could potentially work out um, when it's going to arrive and when they'll need to have a clinic appointment. And there's no reason why it can't be a two-way process, so when you organise your appointment for a colonoscopy, they could put their hand up through, the, 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 through this interaction and, uh, and say, it's not going to be convenient to do it in a week's time, can I do it in, in you know, two weeks' time, because I'm way on holiday. That sort of interaction can occur. So, in summary, um, I think we have to embrace and adopt the principles of, all, of organised screening programmes uh, across Europe, uh, and those countries that aren't doing it need to consider carefully whether that isn't what they should be doing. Uh, we need to develop a, a, a robust screening infrastructure to exploit uh, what is now the, the clinically and most cost-effective screening test. So we need to adopt FIT, that's the way to start. That isn't to say that that's the way it will be in 10 years or 15 years' time. There will be new products that come along. But if you've got a system and a structure, um, then you've got the, the essence of what will be a good screening program. And I suggest that we might need to increasingly exploit the power of the internet to communicate with the population. Uh, and research needs to continue to see how we might be able to reach the, the uh, impoverished po population that generally are reluctant to scream. Thank you very much.